This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org. Let's, let's get started. We're a little bit late, but we're okay. Welcome to the monthly public lecture sponsored by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. It is among the largest vegetarian societies in the United States with more than 1,900 members. Some of the founders of this organization were patients of Dr. McDougall's and were carrying his zeal and his insight forward by founding the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. We are delighted to welcome back to Hawaii Dr. John McDougall. Dr. McDougall has been studying, writing, and speaking out about the effects of nutrition on disease for over 20 years. He is the author of 10 national best-selling books, the international online McDougall newsletter that you can subscribe, subscribe to for nothing. Host, he's host of a nationally syndicated television show, McDougall MD and he's the founder and medical director of the 10-day live-in McDougall program in Santa Rosa, California. Other McDougall activities include seminars and health-oriented adventure vacations. The next one will be in Costa Rica, and it's sold out. Sorry. <laughs> Dr. McDougall is a graduate of Michigan State University's College of Human Health and completed his medical internship at the Queens Medical Center and his residency at the University of Hawaii. So he does belong to us. He is a board certified internist and was once a staff physician at the Castle Medical Center on Oahu in Kailua. Today, Dr. McDougall will present Truth or Dairy, the truth about the dangers of milk and other dairy products, information based on facts and not on big marketing budgets or milk mustaches. Please welcome Dr. McDougall. My name is John McDougall, and as we get started, uh, we have a uh, special honor for me. I have the opportunity to introduce you to a little, some of the members of my family. Uh, Mary is, uh, would you stand up, Mary? Mary's my uh, co-author, my partner, my wife. She's been, we came here in 1972 together with virtually nothing, like, you know, a few hundred dollars in our pocket and started our life here in Hawaii and spent 15 years here. Uh, so this is going to be televised, and uh, I'm going to have to be reserved and not say very many radical things. But if you want to see whether or not any of the things I say are true, you can always go to my website, and you can look at the April and May 2003 newsletters, which uh, are the written basis of the lecture that I'm going to give you. So all the scientific references are there. April, May 2003, and of course you find the newsletter at www.drmcdougall.com, or just put my name in one of the search engines and our website will come up. It's very simple. So you can find this lecture, essentially this lecture, on the DVD set that's also found on my website. Very inexpensive. Probably the best education you'll get for the money. I live in Santa Rosa, California. That's where we run our clinic. Well, we head out to the West Coast, which I do all the time, every time the wind blows, right? 
Of course. Every time the wind blows, I go to the West Coast, just like you guys do, to have fun on the ocean. And on the way from Santa Rosa out to the Pacific Ocean sits this cow. That's a fake cow. My grandson knows that's a fake cow. Every time we go by it, he says fake. And, and the, the dairy industry is a fake industry as far as honesty is concerned. They have false messages to share with people. And they don't care because nobody's willing to stand up and stop them. And I can't stop them, but I can tell the truth to those people who are listening. Remember, the information I'm sharing with you tonight has been on my website since uh, April and May of 2003. I haven't heard anything from them. I've been telling them these things for, well, I've been telling them for these things for at least 25 years. They're not saying anything. There's no reason to because your friends and your relatives are still buying their products. So why should they do anything about it? Anyway, we all owe our education about good nutrition to a cow, right? When I was growing up in Michigan, it was Elsie. Anybody learn from Elsie? And you grow up here, who do you learn from? Lonnie Moo. And if you lived in Santa Rosa or the San Francisco area, you'd learn from Clo. Everybody's got a cow. And that's where our nutritional information comes from is a dumb cow. One very important qualification. And that is when I talk to you about milk and I say the word milk, I'm not speaking of human breast milk for human babies. Okay, so don't get confused. Human breast milk is the only acceptable food for human babies. If you fail to understand this message, then you, you put your family at great risk. Your child has two to four times the risk of crib death. The child and this is fact, has 60 times greater risk of pneumococcal pneumonia in the first three months of life if you bottle feed that baby, 10 times the risk of hospitalization during the first year. They're not very smart either. They have a reduced IQ. And you know, they've actually, they've actually studied this. They've studied the movements of children. They look at them at three and six months of age. You can see this on my website. You can look at the research. It's, it's there. They look at these kids. They look for their spontaneous movements, which is a representation of their brain function. And you can tell the difference between bottle and breastfed babies. They're not very bright. Their behavioral and speech difficulties, the children are sicker. They get more problems than infections, asthma, eczema, type 1 diabetes, and cancer. And later on in life, if you were a bottle-fed baby, you have more risk of heart disease, obesity, diabetes, multiple sclerosis, ulcerative colitis, and Crohn's disease. Those are the facts. So don't do that. Don't bottle feed your baby. Breastfeed your baby. And, you know, I really don't want to get into the discussion, what do I do if I can't? breastfeed. What you do is you get a lactation consultant. You go to the Lechi League. You do everything you can because the risks are too great. The dairy industry is a big, big, big business. Uh, $50 billion a year the dairy industry generates. <clears throat> it's just $16 billion alone for cheese. And they have a lot of money to market. And so they have a marketing campaign that's known as the Dairy Checkoff. You can go to the internet and you can uh, put in your search engine, Dairy Checkoff, and they will talk to you about their marketing plan, which I'm going to talk to you about. This information comes from 2003, but 2006 is basically the same thing, except in 2003, they only had $166 million to spend annually. Now they spend $200 million. And what they say on their website are some very revealing things. What they say is a major component of this dairy management, this marketing campaign. A major component involves conducting and communicating the results of dairy nutrition research. In other words, they have $200 million to do, quote, quote, scientific research to show you how healthful dairy products are. And that's what their website says. And they say also they spend a little bit of this money on issues and crisis management. I am crisis management. I have been crisis management for 25 years for the dairy industry. I don't know how much they spend, but I'm really well centered in their radar. All right, well, I want to tell you what the problem is. Now, you really need to understand what I'm going to say right now to realize why cow's milk should not be fed to human beings. Cow's milk is ideally designed for baby cows. And all the nutritional makeup of that milk is set to grow a cow. Now, each animal has its particular nutritional makeup for its milk that's ideal. There's no mistake. It's happened through 400 million years of evolution, or if you choose, by divine creation. I don't really care. 
But it's ideal, it's perfect, and as a matter of fact, if you look at the scientists that are involved in nutrition today, they look at the milk of the animal they're studying as a reference, and it all has to fit with what they see in the animal's milk, because everybody knows the animal's milk is perfect. Can't be otherwise. Species wouldn't exist. You know that. All right, so here's the problem. Let's just take a look at protein, just as one of the nutrients. We'll look at some other ones in a minute. Let's take a look at the protein content of various animals' milks. The amount of protein in those animals' milks is directly related to the rate of growth of that animal. If the animal must grow fast, it must have very concentrated nutrients to support that growth. The human being grows very slow. The human being protein content of the milk is 1.2 grams for every 100 grams of milk. The human being doubles in size in six months. The human being becomes adult size in 14 to 17 years. We're very slow-growing animals, so we have very low requirements of nutrients as far as the concentration is concerned. A horse has twice the protein content. It doubles in size in 60 days. A dog has almost seven times the protein content in its milk, and a dog doubles in size in eight days. A rat has 11 times the protein content of human milk, and it doubles in size in four and a half days. It becomes an adult rat in three to four months. You get, you get what I'm talking about? The milk is designed ideally to support the growth of that animal. So the problem with cow's milk is it's wrong for people. Let's take a look at some of the other nutrients. The calcium content of cow's milk is four times greater than the calcium content of human milk. Well, you've got to support this rapid growth, this bone structure. You need this concentrated calcium. And so it is with the other nutrients. It's ideally designed for cows. Now, you want to get in trouble? I just heard some mention about uh, animal rights and welfare and so on. You want to you want to offend some animal rights people? You just try feeding cows human breast milk and see what happens. They'll get sick and die because human breast milk has one fourth the protein and one fourth the calcium necessary to support a cow. Can you imagine what would happen? You'd have the Humane Society and the Hawaii Vegetarian Society out after people would do such a silly thing as to feed human breast milk to baby cows. It'd be a crime. They might even put you in jail for that. But you certainly can do the opposite, right? In fact, you're encouraged to do the opposite by dietitians and nutritionists and doctors in the dairy industry. In fact, if you don't, they might put you in jail, right? For doing something so bizarre as to fail to feed cow's milk to humans. But you do the opposite, and they'll figure out that's wrong real quick, because that little cow's not going to grow. Okay, milk, milk, milk builds strong bones. That's the sales pitch, right? And it's because of the calcium, because it's high in calcium and builds strong bones. The first thing you ought to do as a consumer, or let's just say not a consumer, say as a, as a mother or a father that's responsible for the health of, of your family, you ought to look at the research that supports or does not support the claims of the dairy industry. And nobody bothered to do this until September of 2000 when a couple of researchers published their review of the effects of cow's milk on bone health in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. What they did is they looked at the studies that were published on the effect of cow's milk on bone health. And what they found is 57 studies. They looked at the studies as far as methods are concerned, and they figured that 21 of them were really reliable enough to even get any information out of them. Of those 21 studies, 57% showed no benefit from feeding cow's milk and bone health. 29% were favorable. 14% actually showed that feeding cow's milk hurt the bones. Now, one of the things you need to know, and you will know this if you ever look up those 57 studies, is almost every one of them was paid for by the dairy industry. Now, there's a special kind of study that doctors like to see and nutritionists and scientists, and it's called a randomized controlled trial. Now, what that means is you take two groups and you make them look very similar by randomization. And then what you do is you just change one thing in one of the groups. And the other group acts as a control because you didn't change anything. So in this case, what they do is they take two groups, make them similar, and they feed one group milk, extra milk, and they don't do that for the other one. They see what happens to them in a period of time. Six of the seven randomized trials are paid for by the dairy industry. Just look at the bottom corner, you'll see paid for by the dairy industry. Six of the seven trials. 
Only one trial looked at what you're interested in, and that is the effect of fluid milk on postmenopausal women's bones. Isn't that what you're interested in? Is that the pitch? Drink milk, you have strong bones when you go through postmenopausal years. One study ever has looked at the subject that you're interested in. And that study was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition in 1985 by Ricker and Haney, two employees of the dairy industry. And what the study showed is actually feeding extra milk hurt the bones. What they did is they took these two groups, they took one group, they fed them three eight-ounce glasses of skim milk for a year and saw the effect on various parameters in terms of bone health. And they found that those that got the extra milk lost more bone than those who didn't. The only study ever done, the only study that will ever be done, you think it'd be foolish enough to invest in a study like that again? Never. So these are some of the quotes from the study. They say the protein content of the milk supplement may have a negative effect on calcium balance, possibly through an increase in kidney losses of calcium or through a direct effect on bone resorption. That's what it says in the study. Okay, now what I want you to note and remember is the dairy industry knows that protein damages the bones. Their employees published it. They know this. They go on and say in that same study, this may have been due to an average 30% increase in protein intake during milk supplementation. You see, when you add the three 8-ounce glasses of skim milk to the diet, what happens is you're adding extra protein, right? I mean, a lot of protein because you've taken the fat out. So what's left is basically protein, some carbohydrate. Let me tell you what causes osteoporosis, what causes bone loss. What causes bone loss is acid. Everybody who's taken basic science, certainly anybody who's a dietitian, any doctor, any nutritionist, any scientist that deals with these issues knows that the primary buffering system of the body is the bones. So what happens when you eat a, eat a high acid diet is the acid that you eat has to be neutralized so the body's pH balance stays, stays precisely normal. On the American diet, we eat loads and loads and loads of acid. The most acidic food consumed in our society is hard cheese. And the most acidic of all hard cheeses is Parmesan. The other very, very acid foods are poultry and beef and eggs and any kind of shellfish or fish. These are very high acid foods. The alkaline foods in our diet are fruits and vegetables. So if you're going to eat a diet that's mostly acid, which most Americans do, and very little alkaline material, you're going to be delivering this acid load to your body. This is solid science, folks. And so what has to happen is the body has to neutralize the acid. The bones dissolve. They release alkaline materials, carbonates, that neutralize the acids that you just ate. And in the process, you end up losing between 1% and 4% of your adult skeleton per year until you get bones so fragile that you cough and you break a rib. Or you ride along a bumpy road and you break your spine. Or you take a step and your hip fractures. If you look worldwide, you see this relationship. The country by country, population by population, if you compare the hip fracture rate with the diet, what you find is the more animal protein consumed, and that's where you get the acid from, is the animal protein. It's loaded with acid. The more animal protein and acid you consume, the higher rates of fr hip fractures. For example, on the bottom you see populations that eat near vegetarian diets like rural South African blacks. Or people in Papua New Guinea who live as 94% of their diet is sweet potato leaves and roots. Uh, you see the Asian, like in Hong Kong or Singapore, eating mostly rice and vegetables. Very low incidence of hip fracture. As you move up the protein intake to Finland, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, United States, New Zealand, you increase the protein intake and you can increase the hip fracture rate. If you look at the uh, relationship between hip fractures and calcium intake, you see something that is absolutely profound and necessary for you to understand and remember, and that is population by population, the more calcium consumed, the more hip fractures. Undeniable information. This absolutely proves that consuming calcium has little or nothing to do with bone strength. There is no other way to interpret this. And you add to this thousands of other scientific studies that show that calcium is essentially useless when it comes to bone health. And you have to come to the conclusion that this is not going to be a benefit to you to focus on calcium. I want to add just a little side note here. You can help your bones by consuming calcium pills. 
like Tums. Why? Because of the calcium? No. What are Tums? Ant acids. So the the uh, carbonate material that is part of the calcium, part of the Tums, goes into the system and neutralizes the acid from the animal food that you ate. That's how these calcium pills work. It has nothing to do with calcium. It has everything to do with adding base to your system. So now what the dairy industry admits is the calcium has nothing to do with bone health because the scientific literature is so overwhelming. So what do they tell us now? They tell us that really the truth is the reason that the bones are stronger by eating milk products or the pork industry is into it too and so is the beef industry is that these foods add protein and protein causes bones to build. Wait a minute. Research you paid for in the past says just the opposite. Why are you changing your tune? Well, they figured out how to do it. They figured out how to rig the research. With $200 million, you can do anything, right? Sure. And so what they do is they first neutralize the acid in their experimental subjects. They either do it by feeding them a lot of fruits and vegetables. So they neutralize the acid that these people may eat and a little bit of meat that they have in their diet, a little bit of cheese. Or they actually feed them antacids. Now, once you neutralize the acid, then what happens is you see an effect of the protein that causes bones to build. And that is, that is mediated through a hormone that you are going to have to learn about. That's going to be, you know, kitchen table talk pretty soon, just like osteoporosis and artery disease and all kinds of things. You're going to have to learn about insulin-like growth factor one. Insulin-like growth factor one, that means the hormone looks like insulin, but it's not exactly like insulin. And its function is to cause things to grow. It promotes bone growth. And uh, it promotes growth of all tissues in the body. The dairy industry has paid for research that shows that feeding dairy products increase the amount of insulin-like growth factor 1 in a person's body. They did it with adolescents, adolescent girls, and they've done it with postmenopausal women. They've fed them extra dairy products, and their insulin-like growth factor 1 level goes up 10%. So there, the dairy industry has explained what's going on. They now can prove that milk builds strong bones, and the research is solid. In fact, you can promote growth with dairy much better than you can with meat. Duh. You're surprised that dairy is a growth promoter? After all, what is milk intended to do? It's intended to grow a baby cow from 60 pounds to 600 pounds. Wouldn't you expect it to promote growth? Sure. Of course. And that's how it works to promote bone growth. So dairy industry is vindicated, right? <laughs> the problem is, is not only does it promote growth of normal tissue, it also promotes growth of abnormal tissues like cancer. And so if you are a researcher, you are involved in the current scientific literature, what you find is the most exciting and the strongest promoter of cancer that scientists have identified is insulin-like growth factor one. It promotes brain cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer. Why not? It's a growth promoter. It promotes the cells to, to proliferate, and it keeps bad cells from dying like they should. So yeah, they are vindicated, but they, so to speak, have cheese on their face. All right. There's another way that, bone, that dairy builds bones. And you know about this because you've been educated by the drug industry for years that estrogens build bones. In fact, I bet if we did a, 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 a census in this room, we'd probably find that well over half of the women in this room have been on estrogens. And maybe a quarter of you still are. To build your bones. Doctors prescribe estrogens to build bones. And here's another way that milk and cheese and other dairy products promote bone growth is they provide estrogen. 60 to 70% of the estrogen in our food comes from dairy products. Now, how does this happen? Maybe 75 years ago, if you had a cow, your cow lived in the backyard, your cow was your pet. You milked your cow every day, and you got a quart of milk from your cow. And when your cow got pregnant, you gave your cow a break, and you didn't milk your cow. Today, if you're a cow, you provide 24 quarts of milk a day, and if you get pregnant, too bad, Bessie, you're still milking. And so what happens is this. This is the estrogen content in the, in the cow's milk at, at various stages in the cow's life. Non-pregnant cows have 15 micrograms per milliliter of estrogen in their milk. During the first half of pregnancy, it is increased tenfold. 
And in the last days of pregnancy, it's increased, what is that? A lot. 1,000 micrograms per milliliter. So you get these huge doses of estrogen, which promote bone growth and breast cancer growth and uterine cancer growth and precocious puberty so that your little kids have breasts and menstrual periods when they're eight years old. New weight loss campaign. You've heard this, haven't you? Oh, of course. Of course, the dairy industry, spent, they've got $200 million. They can say anything they want, and nobody can stop them. Okay, Michael Zimmel, he's uh, one of the main employees of the dairy industry. He's known in our circles as, a, as an extremely biased, uh, paid henchman for the dairy industry. We know that anything out of that guy's mouth is going to be whatever the dairy industry once said. Michael Zemmel. And uh, he publishes, he designs and manipulates his studies so that they show whatever he wants to show. And so he's come up with a few studies under his direction that show that people who consume milk products, they're not good studies, they're terrible studies. But who cares? you got $200 million to promote them. And they put out advertisements like this. It came out of one of your newspapers or magazines. Recent publications in leading journals suggest a link between dairy consumption and reduced body weight. I want to introduce you to a man. His name is Gregory Miller. Gregory Miller is a Ph.D. in nutrition. He's a real smart guy. Gregory Miller, when I first met him, he was the PR person for the, for the uh, National Dairy Association. Right now, he's a senior vice president of nutrition research of Dairy Management Incorporated. PhD in nutrition. No, he's no lightweight. I did a show back in uh, 1993. It was in the, in the early spring of 1993. I did a show with a man named Virgil Hulse. He's a medical doctor, master's in public health, former dairy inspector of the state of California. And we did a show. National television show. It was called Lifestyle Magazine. I was a regular guest. I was on every episode of the show. And so it was played actually all over the world. When we did this show, we talked about the relationship of dairy and heart disease and cancer and diabetes and constipation and all kinds of things. And we also, remember this is 1993, we talked about mad cow. Mad cow disease. I mean, nobody even heard about that. That would have been a radical idea. You'd be considered a, a quack or a nut to talk about something like mad cow back in 1993. We talked about bovine leukemia viruses, bovine aid viruses. We did a whole half an hour on the dairy industry, and the dairy industry saw the show. Gregory Miller called my producer and said, we need equal time. And so he flew out to get equal time. But my producer said, you are not going to be on that stage alone. Dr. McDougall will be on that stage with you. If you look at the uh, Internet and you search out Dairy Management Incorporated, you'll see statements by Greg Miller. He says things like independent research confirming dairy's role in weight reduction is mounting. He says this helps position dairy foods as part of the solution to America's growing obesity epidemic. And he says informing the public about dairy's role in the fight against obesity will help increase consumption of milk, cheese, and yogurt, among other dairy products. Milk, not just low-fat milk, but milk and cheese and yogurt and anything else we can sell you. That's the statement that really clues you into what Gregory Miller is all about. It's on the internet. Go look it up. I'll talk to you about Gregory Miller a little bit later. Well, let's get back to this weight loss thing. Tell me, when did uh, milk become the miracle weight loss product of the 21st century? I thought milk was designed to grow a little baby cow from 60 pounds to 600 pounds. Why does it all of a sudden cause people to lose weight? I don't understand. It doesn't make any sense, does it? Well, if you look at the research, by the way, paid for by the dairy industry. This comes from a study paid for by the dairy industry. They reviewed the research on dairy products and weight loss. And these are the things that they say in their research papers. They say one of 17 randomized studies found weight loss in people taking calcium pills. Calcium pills, 16 out of 17 showed no weight loss. One study showed weight loss. They go on and say nine randomized studies where fluid milk was added, two showed significant weight gain, and none showed significant loss. These are words from the dairy industry's own article that they paid for. They had a meeting in New Orleans 
which was a symposium on dairy product consumptions and weight regulation. April 21st, 2002, sponsored by Dairy Management Incorporated. Susan Barr, one of the other paid employees of the dairy industry, uh, she published a paper with this conclusion. In conclusion, the data available from randomized trials of dairy products or calcium supplementation provide little support for an effect in reducing body weight or fat mass. The dairy industry knows this is a lie. They know this. And they continue to promote to you and to your family and to the schools and to dietitians and to doctors that dairy products are a miracle weight loss drug. They lie, and they know they lie. But they get away with it. They got $200 million. Who's going to stop them? Nobody. Dick Cheney. Uh, everything you once believed about nutrition is false. I have to tell you that. Because the dairy industry can say anything they want. Uh, the dairy industry has teamed up with the National Medical Association to write articles about the role of dairy in helping reduce the risk of heart disease, hypertension, and other serious health issues like colon cancer. They have teamed up with the National Medical Association to do this. I mean, this has really got to be powerful stuff. And their public policy statements are that you can solve these problems by consuming more dairy. Hey, wait a minute. Who's the National Medical Association? Who are these guys? The National Medical Association promotes the collective interests of physicians and patients of African descent. Now, what do you know about milk products and people of African descent? Have you ever heard of lactose intolerance? Do you know that 90% of African American people have lactose intolerance? In other words, if they drink dairy, eat dairy products with lactose, which most of them have, they get diarrhea, stomach cramps, and gas. They get sick, just like Asians, Eskimos, Hispanics. Now, how is it that the National Medical Association, whose job it is to promote the interests of black people, is tied in with a company that sells something that makes black people sick? They got $200 million. They can do anything they want. All right, let's get to the serious part of this talk. Got milk, got disease. Let me just review some of the things you already know. I'm not going to belabor these things. You already know this. You know milk is high calorie, right? It grows a baby cow from 60 to 600 pounds. High calories promotes obesity, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. It's high fat. You know that. It's 50% it's fat. But 90%, 7% of that fat is saturated fat. It's 50% fat. Cow's milk is. Cheese is 70, 80% fat. It's high fat. Fat promotes obesity, cancer, type 2 diabetes. It's high in saturated fat. 97% of the calories in milk are saturated fat, which promotes heart attacks and strokes. You know all this stuff. You don't want me to go over this again. It's high in protein, so it causes kidney damage, osteoporosis, kidney stones. That bone that gets dissolved, it ends up in your kidney collecting system, solidifies, and you have little bones in now in your kidney collecting system. They're known as kidney stones. Well, almost all kidney stones are calcium oxalate-based from the high-protein American diet. High in acid, which causes uh, osteoporosis and kidney stones. High in cholesterol, promotes heart attacks and strokes, generalized atherosclerosis. It's very low in iron, contains almost no iron, so it contributes to anemia and iron deficiency. It has no dietary fiber, so it can, no diet, no dietary fiber, not a speck, so it contributes to constipation. What it does have more than anything else is a lot of contamination. It is uh, low in carbohydrate, except for basic cow's milk, which is 50% carbohydrate, or 30% carbohydrate. It has no vitamin C, so you have problems with tissue healing. It's deficient in essential amino acids, which contributes to problems, neurologic problems like multiple sclerosis. It's high in environmental contaminants, loaded with them. Oh, do you remember? Oh, come on. Some of you remember this. In one year, they had to pull milk off the shelves in the state of Hawaii because it was contaminated with heptachlor, tuberculosis, and then penicillin. Oh, whoa, dairy industry. You had to take and deprive our poor children of Hawaii of milk three times in one year. I'm sure some of you felt sorry for them. Your poor kids didn't get milk that day. Oh, no heptachlor. Uh, high in allergy, autoimmune diseases, leads to multiple allergy problems, and it's loaded, with, it's loaded with microbes. I hear you guys have a new microbe problem around here. 
But what if I told you milk's even worse than the Alawai Canal? Would you believe me? Nah, you wouldn't, but it is. All right. Now, I want to defend the dairy industry a little bit. The dairy industry has morals. They have principles. And they set out a rule in 1993 that, as far as I know, they've stuck to. And that is that they will not allow to be sold to your children and to the public any milk that contains more than 750,000, that's three quarters of a million pus cells per cc. It's against their rules. 750,000 pus cells are allowed. Per, you know how much of a cc is? That's a 30th of an ounce. 30th of an ounce. Okay, study in their journal, the Journal of Dairy Science, published in 2002, confirms that they stick to their principles. They looked at the milk in the state of New York, and on average, it contains 363,000 pus cells. You think I'm exaggerating, right? Per cc, and that's to fight off the 24,000 bacteria per cc. Now, they know about this, and I think that if they're going to get honest ever, any time, any day, they ought to have truth in advertising, and they ought to change their milk mustache ads to read like this. Contains a quarter million pus cells and 25,000 bacteria. Drink milk. Can you imagine a baseball player or a model or somebody with that, uh, like the Alawai Canal all over your face? <laughs> all right. Uh, the dairy products were the dairy products were the products most often recalled by the FDA between 1993 and 1998. Of all the foods, dairy was the most recalled for things like salmonella, staphylococcus, listeria, deadly E. coli. Uh, a type of uh, paratuberculosis that uh, many people believe causes Crohn's disease. I want to talk to you about one particular infection that's never talked about. <clears throat> they got this one really buried, but you ought to know about it. And that's the infection of our cows. I don't mean just dairy products, but I also mean our eating cows. You know, the ones we make steaks out of and ribs and stuff like that. They're infected with bovine immunodeficiency virus, which is abbreviated BIV and bovine leukemia viruses. You need to know that bovine AIDS virus, which is bovine immunodeficiency virus, is almost, is almost indistinguishable from human AIDS virus. They're so close molecularly. If you look at some of the data, some of the old data, in fact, I think this, this one right here is 20 years old, so I know it's much worse now. But 40% of the beef herds were found to be infected with bovine, bovine AIDS virus, and 64% of the dairy herds were found to be infected with bovine AIDS virus. And this, this statistic is right up to date. I mean, right today, right now, at the moment, and that is that 9 out of 10 herds in the United States of America are infected with bovine leukemia virus, and that's a government statistics. 9 out of 10 herds are infected. If you look around the world, what you find is where cattle, cattle is big, so is infection with these retroviruses. In Canada, 70% of the cows are infected. In Argentina, the infection rate is 84% of the herds are infected with bovine leukemia viruses. Now, those countries don't take this serious, but there are countries who take these infections very seriously. Many European countries have taken these infections very seriously because they, they're concerned about their population. For example, Finland. Finland in 1996 declared victory with an eradication program that they started 30 years before to get rid of all bovine leukemia viruses in their cattle. That meant they had to kill an awful lot of cattle. But they thought it was worth it to protect their citizens was to kill these infected animals. And again, there are many other European countries that are on the same page. They're concerned. They're concerned. So much so that they sacrificed hundreds of millions of dollars. But our cattle industry is not concerned. Uh, herds that are infected with bovine immunodeficiency virus, that's bovine AIDS virus, are usually infected with bovine leukemia virus. Why is that? It's because of the way we practice our farming practices. <clears throat> uh, these cattle, they are uh, tattooed with the same instruments. They use the same dehorning instruments, same syringes from cow to cow to cow, spreading infection. They feed milk. To the, uh, to the baby cows that comes from pooled colostrum. They take milk from a lot of mommy cows, put it all together in one big bucket, and then feed it to a whole bunch of baby cows. They spread infection that way. It goes from mother to baby also as direct transmission through the breast milk. And that's how they spread the infection. But there's another way that they spread the infection too that's kind of interesting. And that was brought out by Howard Lyman. Some of you have heard Howard Lyman speak, yeah? 
Yeah, sure, great, great man. And he got into a lot of trouble when he went on Oprah Winfrey's show and talked about some of these problems, including mad cow disease. And Oprah said, I'll never eat another hamburger again. And that was the beginning of the lawsuit. You know that story. Okay, well, the problem was, just to summarize, for those of you who do or do have forgotten or don't know, the problem is, is at that time, <clears throat> that was before 1997, at that time, what the common practice was, was to take sick cows, and when they, I don't even know if they waited until they died, but they, anyways, they took these very sick cows, called downer cows, and they would grind them up and put them into the cattle feed. So they were feeding sick cows or dead cows to live cows. It was part of their cattle feed. It was called awful. You need to know the term. Okay. So the dairy industry, after the Oprah Winfrey show, they showed their, their principles, their morals, their concern for you. And they banned, in 1997, the feeding of dead cows to live cows. Okay, but here's a report from US, USA Today, front page, by the way, June 10th, 2003. What they tell us in this front page report in USA Today is that the dairy industry still feeds dead cows to chickens and pigs. Okay, so you don't eat chickens and pigs. But then what they do is this. You see the chickens, they eat, and the pigs, they eat the dead cow, and they're not really very, very polite. They don't have very good table manners, and they drop some of it on the floor. And then they also, they poop a lot of this undigested dead cow out. And that lands on the floor, too. And then what the, the, the industry does is it takes all that scrapings from the floor, and it puts it together and crushes it into pills, and then they feed that to live cows. <laughs> I'm not joking. That's common practice. You talk to any dairy farmer or cattle farmer, that's everyday practice. That's what, by the way, this USA Today front page story said. And it still goes on. It's not changed since then. Okay, then we have the waste plate exemption. If you go to a restaurant, you order a steak, and you don't finish it, well, you're not going to throw that good meat away. You can take and put that in a bucket, which is destined to go back to make food for live cows. That's the weight plate exemption. And then we also can take those dead cows, we can grind them up and feed them to pets. You know there are some unethical farmers that actually buy pet food and feed it to their cows? Can you believe that? And then, I don't know whether any of you have ever had this opportunity. When I was a, a college student, before I decided to become a doctor, I was in an animal husbandry program, and I got myself a trip to the slaughterhouse. And they waste nothing. Nothing, including the blood. And so what they do is they take the blood from the dead cow, and they make it into a milk formula which they feed to the calves. These are everyday practices in every part of the dairy industry throughout the country. And they say they can't change it because they can't compete economically if they didn't do these kinds of things. That's what they say. Okay, the concern. Both viruses can cross species lines. You can take these viruses, bovine AIDS and bovine leukemia viruses, and you can infect other animals, such as sheep, goats, and chimpanzees, and they get sick. For example, one experiment published in 1974, they fed six young chimpanzees cow's milk, and within a year, two died of leukemia. Nationwide and worldwide, wherever you look at populations, what you find is that the more dairy they consume, the more leukemia and lymphoma in the population. There's an increased incidence of leukemia among people who contact cows closely, like butchers and dairy farmers and veterinarians. Now, most animals that get infected, they don't live long enough to get sick because they're off to the slaughterhouse when they're very young. You know that, right? Okay. But still, even though most are off to the slaughterhouse when they're young, 1% to 5% of infected cows develop malignant leukemias and lymphomas. Now, if you get leukemia or lymphoma, and you go to the doctor, and you and, and a lot of people get these diseases every year. There's 30,000 cases of leukemia and 70,000 cases of lymphoma. And you go to your doctor, well, and I can say without exception, you go to your doctor, you say, doctor, why did my child, why did my wife, why did my husband get this disease? The doctor says, we don't know. We have no idea how we get this disease. Now, you take your cat to the veterinarian. And what does the veterinarian do for your cat every year? Or not every year, but as part of a routine health of your cat. Gives your cat an injection of feline leukemia virus vaccine, right? Yes? No? Yes? Are you with me? So veterinarians know there's a problem with leukemia viruses, but somehow it's okay to feed people leukemia viruses and AIDS viruses. It's okay. 
It's okay. You shouldn't be worried about it. The dairy industry and the USDA aren't worried about it. Let me tell you why they aren't worried about it. They've known about these infections since 1969. So that's over 35 years they've known about these infections in the cattle. And the reason they're not worried about it is based upon the tests they use. They cannot find these bovine leukemia and AIDS viruses in people. So their official policy is because they cannot find them in people, any evidence in people, it's not a problem. You just go ahead and pour your child a tall, cool glass of leukemia virus. It's not a problem. That's what they say. But now they got a problem. They got a problem because our, our techniques, our science has gotten better, and so we can detect things much more easily and more precisely with new technology. And so there was a study done at UC Berkeley just recently where they took uh, 265 people off the street, and they took their blood, and they checked it by present scientific methods, and they found that 74% of people had evidence of previous or present infection with bovine leukemia virus. Now they can't say that anymore because we find it in people, 74% of people. We also find this virus in breast cancer patients, in their tumors. All right, let's, let's go on. I'm sure you're tired of this. Let's talk about kids, because I know you're not tired about kids. You know, you can do anything to adults. You don't, I'm sure you don't care too much about you as adults eating a nice slice of Parmesan leukemia virus, but think about feeding your kid uh, some of these products, and you might get a little upset about it, but really the target of the dairy industry is your kids. They're out after your kids. Now, they have these programs. The American School Fund Service Association is tied up with the dairy industry to develop a school milk pilot test program so they get kids to drink more milk. And they're developing all kinds of interesting techniques to get kids to drink more milk. I remember when I was a child in school, in grade school, we had milk for sale. Two cents for white milk, three cents for chocolate. I always forked over the extra penny because I couldn't get the white down. Now they have strawberry, they have fancy straws and cartons. They have all kinds of techniques to get these kids to drink more of that milk, and they're succeeding. If you look at uh, the Internet, you can go home and look at it tonight, you can see on the... Uh, Dairy Management Incorporated cite the following statement. The goal is to guide school aid children to become lifelong consumers of dairy products. 2003 activities will target students, parents, educators, and school food service professionals. Listen to those words. The goal is to guide school aid children to become lifelong consumers of dairy products. What other industry talks that way? What other industry tries to hook kids on their product? Sure, the tobacco industry. These are the same words the tobacco industry uses. And they're succeeding. Annual consumption of uh, children 6 to 12 years old has increased to 28 gallons per child per year. Children under the age, age of 18 drink 46% of the milk. They're succeeding. They're winning. Babe, $200 million, you can do anything you want. And nobody's going to stop them. Now, let's talk about a little problem with children that actually I noticed when I was a, a family practitioner. I used to be a family practitioner on the Big Island of Hawaii. I worked for the Hamakua Sugar. I was uh, a doctor in Honoka'a for three years. And I saw I, every day, several times a day, kids coming in with belly aches and constipation and bloody stools every day. Now, Mom didn't know there was a problem because she had the same difficulty. She thought that was a normal part of life. Researchers published a study in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1998 that looked at severely constipated kids. How'd you get into the study? Well, you didn't have a bowel movement, but every three to 15 days. That is not unusual. And these kids had to have a laxative to have that bowel movement. They took these children off cow's milk and they put them on soy milk. Not that soy milk is particularly good, but at least it solved the problem that they were having. And they found that nearly 70% of the kids were cured when they stopped the cow's milk. They were cured of their constipation. Cured. And they biopsied these kids' rectums, and they found that these, their, their colons were inflamed, and they had anal fissures that caused horrible pain when they defecated. And then they put these kids back on cow's milk 8 to 12 months later, and every single one of the children became constipated within 5 to 10 days. So, see, it's not just the lack of fiber. You, your kids actually have an allergic reaction to the cow milk protein that causes them 
to have a paralyzed gut and they get constipated. I think that's terrible. I really do. I mean, if it was just for this particular problem with cow's milk, all the schools in the country should ban it and do education programs just like they do against drug addiction and teenage sex. They should do education programs to teach the parents and the kids not to consume this harmful product. This is terrible child abuse to cause these kids to suffer like this. Don't you think so? Don't you think if you caused a kid to have bloody bowel movements and pain in their rectum and stomach pains and headaches and arthritis and snotty noses and acne, if you caused them to have these difficulties with a stick, what would, what would our society do to you? They would put you in jail. But because you do it with a fork and spoon, it's acceptable. Ministers do it. Policemen do it. School teachers do it to their kids. It's normal, proper behavior to cause this kind of suffering. Uh, all kinds of things happen to kids when they drink cow's milk. Yeah. Snotty noses, ear infections. Uh, did you ever wonder why your neighbor's kid is going to the doctor every month with a, for an ear infection? Think there's some kind of new bacteria out there? Dairy is at the root of these problems with these kids. And they have gastroesophageal reflux disease and eczemas and all kinds of problems. Why? Because cow's milk is not meant for kids. Cow's milk is meant for baby cows. The American Academy of Pediatrics made a statement in 1994. They reviewed the literature on type 1 diabetes in cow's milk, and they said early exposure of infants to cow's milk protein may be an important factor in the initiation of beta cell destructive processes in some individuals. The beta cells make insulin. So what they found, they concluded in 1994, was feeding cow's milk to little kids initiates the destruction of their insulin-producing cells and leads to type 1 diabetes. And the research today supports that very solidly. And they recommended that kids avoid cow's milk to prevent type 1 diabetes. There is a big one. You want to ruin a family? You want to ruin a family? Give them a child with type 1 diabetes. You'll ruin a family. All right, if you go to the internet tonight, and I encourage you to write this address down, it's the National Library of Medicine. It is www.nlm.nih.gov. That's National Library of Medicine, National Institutes of Health, Government. That's what it stands for. And you put in there cow's milk, dairy products, and you put in various terms. And what you'll find is there is a causal relationship or an association with the following problems that has been published in the scientific literature. Things like canker sores, tonsil enlargement. You know why those tonsils get big and those adenoids get big? They're there to, this is a, this is a ring called the Wallerian ring. And it's your first line of defense for incoming substances through your mouth. And so what happens is you're, you're causing these foreign proteins, which could be viruses, bacteria, to come into your system and your body's fighting them. Well, in the process of fighting them, the tonsils and the adenoids have to enlarge. That's their job. Uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease, ulcer disease, col uh, colic, stomach cramps, bloody stools, painful defecation, chronic constipation, colitis, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, uh, snotty noses, uh, ear infections, uh, sinusitis, wheezing, asthma problems, uh, nonspecific arthritis, just like just painful joints, but also rheumatoid arthritis and juvenile rheumatoid arthritis and lupus. You'll find that association in the, when you search the National Library of Medicine. Rashes, uh, atopic dermatitis, eczema, seborrhea, hives. Uh, neurologic problems such as multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, autism, schizophrenia, headaches, fatigue, mental depression, and bedwetting problems. Oh, this is a fun one. I get a, I get a letter from a mother oh, every few months talking to me about what they'd been through in terms of bedwetting problems with their kid until they read one of our books or heard one of the DVDs. They said, what, what do I have to lose? I mean, I've been taking this child to the psychiatrist faithfully every month for bedwetting problems, and he or she's now 10, 11, 12 years old, and the psychiatrist hadn't helped. The psychiatrist told me when I was changing the kid's diaper when he was a little baby, I probably touched the wrong part. And now there's something wrong with him. Well, what, what happens is this. When you drink the milk, when you drink the milk, the milk goes into the gut, into the bloodstream, and then it's filtered into the bladder, and the proteins cause an allergic reaction, and the bladder swells like a big hive. Okay, and it becomes insensitive. The bladder becomes insensitive, so the child goes to bed at night, and the bladder fills up with urine, 
And the child can't feel it because it's all, the tissues are all swollen. And the first thing the child feels is the wet bed sheets. They get off the milk. In the vast majority of cases, the bedwetting goes away. The sensitivity of the bladder returns. And you can stop going to the psychiatrist. Iron deficiency, anemia, nephrotic syndrome, glomerular nephritis, uh, SIDS we talked about. Ather you know, atherosclerosis, interesting finding is that if you look at people who have terribly rotten arteries, you know, heart disease, strokes, terrible artery disease all over their body, the rottenest arteries you find are in people who have the highest levels of antibodies directed to dairy protein. Well, what happens is you eat the dairy protein. Now, I know you gave up the fat. You're now drinking skim milk, but you're drinking dairy protein. That's what skim milk is. So the dairy protein comes into the body. The body recognizes that protein is foreign. It could be a virus or a bacteria. It makes antibodies. Well, let's go back and talk about Greg for a while. Greg Miller. Greg Miller, Ph.D. Okay, so Greg gets his half hour on the television show, and this is the way it went. You can see me, right? Heart disease, diabetes constipation, leukemia virus. You see my, I'm counting them on my fingers, right? Okay, I'm just laying it on. And uh, Greg Miller offers his defense about three minutes into the show. And uh, what he does is he reaches into his pocket and provides the only defense that he could muster. He did not once say that you're wrong, the scientific literature does not show this, it does not show that, you know, you're misleading the public. Not once. This was his only defense other than saying the dairy industry are very nice, good people, and they, would, they have the best nutritional product out there. His only defense was the following. He says, right now on the, on the, on the airplane, I tried to figure out what to, to, to say to you and to the public so they really understand how healthful dairy is. So he reaches into his pocket, and he pulls out a picture of his two kids. And he says, if there was any thought that dairy products were in any way harmful, there's no way I would let them consume them. His two-year-old son consumes milk, yogurt, cheese regularly, and the five-and-a-half-old daughter is on a cow milk-based formula. That's his only defense. If there was something wrong with him, I wouldn't feed him to my kids. That's it. That's all he's got to say. So, anyway. I'm glad to be here. I'm certainly happy that all of you were willing to give up some of your evening. I hope I gave you some things to think about. And uh, good health and the opportunity to enjoy yourself and your family really comes from making the right choices. Vegetarian society and a vegetarian diet is the way to do it. It's the only way to do it. And if you ever come to California, come and visit. Thank you very much. This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and helpful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344 or visit our website at www.vsh.org, vsh.org.